everyone. Hey. Uh, hi, thanks for joining us today for this discussion on crowdsourcing. And we've got um, three experts all in different areas here. Um, so I'm just going to kick off and ask you, um, Chris, I'll come to you first. Um, in terms of crowdsourcing, how did Aperio get into it? Was it the, the platform first and then the, the scale grew from there? Or did you go for the big market and develop market first? Well, I mean, we, from the beginning, have been trying to disrupt the professional services industry. It's a $350 billion industry, and right now it's a foot race to add more direct labor. We thought, hey, let's rethink that nine years ago, and as a result, we started to crowdsource from day one. And, you know, we believe that crowdsourcing is the multi-tenancy of professional services. So as a result, we've ramped up, you know, now 900,000 designers, developers, data scientists, and have created in essence, a marketplace or a platform for expertise. Okay, Brady? Brady? Uh, I run Highway One, and we have a lot of hardware companies that come through our program. So we're working with young hardware companies, they have prototypes, they want to turn into a product. And along the way, they often end up using crowdsourcing to help fund their working capital. But we generally encourage the companies to do a small raise before they go to VC, and, I mean, before they go to crowdfunding, because you want to make sure you can actually deliver the product before you start taking people's money. So it's definitely a tool, but it's not the only tool for these companies. So yours was the platform was the most important thing, and then the scale afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Nia? So we have a little bit of a different tweak on that. So we, Movit is a public transit app for users, and when we started, we were eight people, and we figured out that uh, there's no data around the world about it, so we built our own platform in order to start developing it, and we figured out that it's not scalable, and we asked ourselves, what if we're gonna let people around the world just use our platform to build the data, and it worked. I mean, people did it. Okay, and um, obviously you've all benefited from you know, huge growth from when you started out, um, but are you aiming for limitless growth or are you putting a cap on it? Are there, are there moral implications here that you need to take into consideration? Nir? So I don't think that there is any limitation on our side. Uh, we are looking at crowdsource today from two different aspects. One is the original part when we let people help us build the data, the infrastructure data for public transit. But now we're gathering about 100 million data points a day from the crowd that actually uses Moveit, and we use this for different uh, types of uh, service to the other users, so there's, there's almost no limit to the growth of the amount of data we're collecting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we think about um, you know, the top 40 professional services firms in the world, um, they're all growing at a, you know, a nice clip, single-digit clip. And by 2025, they'll have 5 million employees. This is just the top 40. So if you think about that industry, they attrit somewhere between 17 and 20% of their employees a year. So by 2025, they have 5 million employees. A million of them are moving jobs, you know, basically to each other. So our view of the world is actually, how can we create and put really cool units of work, really cool projects on our platform, and then we'll attract amazing talent, amazing supply. So we, you know, we're adding 40 to 50,000 members a quarter right now. So we'll hit the million member mark. You know, we, we'll get to two million, we'll get to three million. The challenge of limitless growth, to, to your question, is really cool work. Great, compelling work that the supply wants to participate in. And so we think there's limitless growth on the supply side. It's, it's not a supply side challenge or a talent challenge. It's the demand side. What are the types or the units of work you want to put on that platform? Okay. And I think for startups, one of the things you're seeing is crowdsourcing really reduces the amount of capital you have to raise and allows you to preserve a lot of your equity for the future. So whereas before, a hardware company would have to raise two to five million to fund their inventory, now they can just go to crowdfunding and have that and have the people who are going to use the product help fund the company. VCs don't like to invest in inventory. And so it's what's allowing there to be kind of a hardware renaissance is the fact that users are getting involved and helping to make these companies possible. I'll come back to the uh, hardware renaissance uh, because that's an interesting issue around crowdsourcing. But um, you mentioned about the, the money side of things. And I wonder for each of you, um, how do you balance out user engagement and numbers of users with profitability? How are you looking at this as a money-making model? Brady, do you want to? Well, I mean, for our companies, they have to start factoring in, how is this hardware going to make us money? I mean, the way we look at it is hardware is used to deploy software. So 
any piece of connected hardware is going to be tied back to a service. And so as you have more users join the platform, then hopefully that service will become more valuable. And then as competitors start to come on and start to mimic your product, they'll need to tie into your service. And that's how hardware companies ultimately will make money and show value, is the platform. Okay. Yeah. In our case, again, it's, it's very different because we need to make sure that our users will understand that we will never charge them for the service. And once you're not charging your users for the service, then it's a great thing because a lot of people are downloading it, using it, and we're growing it at 2 million new users a month now, and uh, we have more than 30 million users. But the question is where the money should come from is quite easy for us because there are a lot of services that uh, people are consuming uh, in our world where we could actually charge the operators, the service providers, like every taxi ride that we generate through MoveIt, the taxi operators pays us, not the users. So you need to find a, a balance between growing your community, uh, encouraging people to be part of your, your community because you are not going to charge them for money and generate revenues from different sources. Okay. Yeah, I mean, our, our members join TopCoder for three reasons. They either want to develop new skills. So we launch a series of Swift challenges, and you know, in eight weeks, we have 5,000 developers writing against iOS Swift. So skill development's one. Second is collaboration. They want to be around other developers. They want to learn from other designers. You know, they want to be part of a community. And third is to make money and to win. Now, ideally, you're doing all three. You're making money, you're learning skills, you're meeting with people, but oftentimes we can be running a massive algorithm challenge to do early earthquake detection, and we're not paying out anything. They're just doing it because it's a really hard and cool problem to solve. Uh, so it's really those three. Okay. If I may add something yeah. to that, I mean, some people are laughing at me and saying, you know, you don't, you don't need to take care of money because we were lucky enough to raise more than $80 million, but I think that the fact that we've raised so much money shows that our investors were really encouraging us to keep running forward, keep pushing the community, and not really being very focused on generating revenues. Because at a certain point, when you have so many users that are in, in such a retention, you find ways to make money. Did the $80 million come because of the big users, uh, user numbers you had, or were they, what came first? Well, you have to ask the investors. But seriously, I think that it's a combination of the fast grow, growth and also the fact that we're generating unique data infrastructure that today is 50% larger than Google Maps. Yeah, I mean, I, think, I, mean, t I, I mentioned the, on the member or the, uh, the uh, community side, there's three motivations. Certainly, on the enterprise side, you know, we're trying to monetize by subscribe to the platform, we charge a markup fee, and then we can, we can sell them a community architect. But it is, right now for us, it's getting more and more enterprises. You know, it's companies like Coca-Cola or United Healthcare or uh, Facebook who are, who are consuming the crowdsourcing service. That's a higher bar right now because there's questions around quality and privacy and security and very similar types of questions that existed in the offshore world 20 years ago that are now fast forward being applied to enterprise crowdsourcing. So with the, um, with the top coder model and the Appear model, is that something that, is that your target area now into the enterprise market and with those companies? Yeah, I mean, we, we go into our enterprise uh, customers really with two different offerings. We help them migrate to solutions like Salesforce.com, Workday, Amazon, Google, et cetera, with a more traditional consulting approach. But we also bring to bear our community to help them do that better, faster, cheaper with a higher level of innovation. Uh, some companies, some enterprises, just want to use and subscribe to our crowdsourcing platform. You know, they believe that is the you know, talent pool of the future. Um, but in other cases, a more conservative company that just wants to move off of Siebel and onto Salesforce, we can bring them our traditional consultants as well. And do you have certain standards for the people who join your community? Do they have to go through some coding challenge or something? Yeah, I mean, honestly, we get, again, 40 to 50,000 signups a quarter. Um, the standard is really developed by participating, practicing. You're competing against dozens or hundreds of other players. You don't have to go through a massive certification process. You end up getting badged and earning points over time. And so a red-rated top coder member, for example, they've proven their value because they've won a lot of challenges. And a red-rated member actually skips levels of interviewing at Google and Facebook because they're proven. They've done it. So it's not a go take this test and then you can be in the community. It's 
hey, just come on and join. And, and then and we'll that, prove it over and time. And so those badges turn into money for them. The badges can turn into money. It can, could turn into experience. It could turn into, a, again, a better job interview at Facebook. Not necessarily just the money. It's, it's also a way to build a community without spending too much resources on managing it. For example, in our case, how can you trust the person that just map a public transit data in a city without level of reviewing by others? So we create different levels of reviewers, and all of a sudden there's a pyramid of, of editors and super editors that review the, the other people's work, and we don't need to spend 200 people's time to just review a community of 100,000 editors. So do you have like a, a really small number of in-house developers and staff and you just rely on all these, this crowd it's, outside of the yeah, company? Yeah, it's not a developers. We have a team of eight people, operational guys, who are actually managing more than 800 cities around the world. And, and in each and every one of these cities, we have a community. And you ha we have a hierarchy of editors and super editors within the community. So just to give you an example, today there is a strike in London for the DLR. Yes. And the community initiated the data that there is a strike. Somebody needs to review it, to approve it. And once it's approved, automatically DLR is out of our trip plan. And we are the only company around the world that is able to do it because there are tens of thousands of people around the world watching uh, for us uh, what's going on. I could have benefited from that this morning myself. Um, so, <laughs> Brady, where you get started? Yeah, increasingly our companies are using crowdfunding as a way of building their community. So if they're not quite ready to ship, they'll do a small kind of Kickstarter beta where they'll do a small run, get to know the community, get some beta units out to customers, and then come back six months later, nine months later with the full run. And that way they're slowly building the community as they go along and not just going for one big bang. And you mentioned earlier about the using crowdsourcing as a, for a hardware renaissance, and obviously hardware has been declining in the, the tech industry. What, what type of hardware is most popular on the, your platform? Well, I mean, on you know, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, you have to look at who's going there, and it's mostly uh, younger people with disposable income, so techies. So what you'll see is a lot of gadgets do well, but something that's more serious that you're going to rely on, uh, like for a family issue, like an elderly care service, does not work as well on a crowdsourcing platform. Yeah. Moxley, one of our, uh, is a breastfeeding company that went through Highway 1. They are not going to crowdfund their service. Like pregnant women are going to want to buy it directly from Moxley when they actually go to market. Okay. And Chris, you mentioned um, about the, you know, you've got these skilled programmers and developers on the uh, top funder. It sounds like it's almost a potential replacement for the IT outsourcing model. Yeah. Yeah, it is. In essence, um, you know, we think of, you know, a lot of companies will f feel like they have a number of FTEs that do work for them. And, you know, we kind of call it a, a, a CTE, a crowd time equivalent. If you think about a more productive work unit, and it's actually not just a one-for-one -one map, you're getting the benefit of collective or global wisdom. So you can drive faster innovation, you know, a broader set of capabilities. You know, traditionally, if you want to go develop a mobile app, you go to somebody who's available in, on your staff or available in your consulting world. If you can put that same mobile app to be designed out on our community, you're gonna get dozens if not hundreds of people competing for that. So you get a level of innovation uh, in speed of development that you wouldn't get in a traditional model. And can you see a time when uh, companies, whether they're technology companies or just end user organizations, might reduce the size of their own IT departments and technical people and instead rely on crowdsourcing? Absolutely, I mean, I, I think uh, I mean, I know earlier it introduces, uh, is this the tipping point? I still think it's early in, the t in terms of enterprise crowdsourcing, but I think the professional services industry, I like to say, the, the PS industry is going Hollywood. If you think about the Hollywood work model, people aren't, aren't uh, tied to a, um, you know, are tied to, to the different studios. They are tied to movies and projects. They descend on a project, they're loyal to that producer, director, and then they do the film and then they move away. We think projects in IT will over, over time happen the same way. It's a loose collection of people that come together around a project and then they disband. I think that the notion of employee loyalty in our space will change. People are loyal to the work units, not necessarily to their organization. Okay. Nir, is that something um, reflected in your, your space, in the mapping side space, where obviously it's more consumers who you're relying on as opposed to these skilled technical people? Yeah, but in the same time, if you think about it, you know, in one hand you have the consumers and in the other hand, traditionally, there was always the municipalities, the Ministry of Transport, who used to actually manage all this information exclusively. 
all of a sudden, you know, we are being approached by so many municipalities or Ministry of Transport saying, hey, you're creating something that we're working so hard and still not able to do. And there's a huge gap between the traditional government institutions and, and the consumers that we're able to, to bridge very, very quickly by showing them that the data is, is now more accurate and they can actually use the data. So it seems like, like in the, in the enterprise industry, that the gap can be closed by the community and the, the government. And are there any locations at the moment around the world where the, the mover application isn't going so well when you haven't got that, that team of on, on the ground people to, to help build the, the mapping system? So, so I'm not sure I understand. Places where we don't have it? So if you look at the world today, even today in November 2015, I think that less of 60% of the uh, metro areas around the world are mapped. And what happened is that data exists in very different ways and people are still suffering from a high level of uncertainty. And our goal is in the next three years to completely cover the world. And it, we are mainly looking at the second, third tier cities where nobody cares about investing the time and money to map. And crowd can always do that. Okay. Are you contributing to OpenStreetMap? We're contributing on a, on a weekly basis to OpenStreetMap. But OpenStreetMap is just the mapping part of it. Uh, there's a lot of data that does not exist, like timetables, mm -hmm. real-time information. But uh, yes, we're working very closely with OpenStreetMap. And Brady, do you think that the, um, the crowdsourcing model, will continue, even though it's a, a software-based thing, will continue to help with hardware innovation and new forms of hardware? Like I'm thinking of 3D printing, really, sort of like grew up and you know, was helped by crowdsourcing platforms. Well, I think you see that with uh, Thingiverse, which was created by the MakerBot team. And that allows anyone to upload a 3D product. Uh, and then folks can take it. They can modify it. I think there's actually a bust of me up there. And so if somebody <laughs> wanted to make, like, a Brady Forest bust in various sizes to fit in your living room, you could go and do that. <laughs> Stephen Colbert is also there, and I, I respect your choice. But I think we're already seeing this in hardware, in manufacturing, and as 3D printers get better and faster and have better materials, then it may actually start to make a meaningful difference in manufacturing. Okay. Great. Well, we're, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but that's really uh, interesting. Thanks. It's been interesting, the impact it could have on IT outsourcing in enterprises and in, in hardware as well. So thanks very much, Chris, Brady, and Nir, and thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Madeline.